When we take oaths, whether it is for political office or testimony on a court or at a wedding altar, when we take those oaths, we are promising that we will keep our word. When little kids get into argument over a toy, for example, and that argument escalates and one of the children will want to end the argument through seriousness, they will often say, I promise, cross my heart and hope to die, thus ending the argument. And some of our favorite songs have to do with promises or broken promises. Songs like Shattered Dreams or I'll Promise You the World or I'll Swear were all number one hits at one time or another. Sadly, many people make vows that are what I call Mary Poppins promises, pie crust promises, easily made and easily broken. Often, as you know, politicians do not follow through on their word and why they were elected in the first place. Uh, People lie under oath and many marriages end in divorce. Many of the love songs that we treasure are nothing but cotton candy of emotions. On the outside, it looks good, but there's really nothing to sink our teeth into. If, in fact, promises were payments, many people would no longer be in debt. One of the grand truths of the gospel of Christianity is that Almighty God always keeps his promises. When we break them, when we fail in our word, he nevertheless always comes through. He never strikes out at the plate. He never apologizes for not showing up when he said he would. He never bows his head in shame because he's let one of us down. And our story today in 2 Samuel chapter 5 is really a dramatic moment in the history of Israel, both this chapter and the next. And it is a dramatic moment in the history of our faith. It reminds us, even those of us today, sitting here in 2020 and the year we have had, and it's not over yet, (laughs) we can sit here and leave with the bedrock assurance that no matter what happens, God always keeps his promises to his children, always. In a world of broken promises, this is great news. Now, chapter five, if you have ever seen a collage, say on Facebook or social media, Uh, collage that we might see there has maybe four pictures or six pictures and they're taken at various times in various places and the intent of that collage is to tell a story that's exactly what we have in 2nd Samuel chapter 5 we have a collage of the life and kingdom of David they are not arranged chronologically don't let that slip because it is on purpose These are stories that they're all connected to tell one great theme, but they're not arranged chronologically. Some events, for example, happen at the beginning of David's kingly reign, and some happen at the end. Uh, In verse 11, for example, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent masons and materials during the last decade of David's life, not at the beginning. This is the same Hiram who also sends materials to build the temple during Solomon's reign. So this happens at the end of David's life, and yet it's here. The report in verses 13 through 16 of David's wives and concubines and the birth of all of his sons do not take place on one day. Rather, they are stretched out throughout the life of David as king. And then in verses 17 through 25, the defeat of the Philistines actually precede David's capture 
of Jerusalem in verses 6, 7, and 8. So they happen actually before that occurs. But all of these stories are placed in 2 Samuel 5 to again encourage us and remind us that God always keeps his promises. Every story here, and there's about a half a dozen, tell the tale, God keeps his promises. Now, in Old Testament Jewish history, there are dramatic moments that are celebrated by Israel. One of the most dramatic periods of history that you might tell me, and you would be right, is the exodus of Egypt, where Israel is saved by God and flees Egypt, and that is commemorated every year during the celebration of the Passover. That is a dramatic moment in the history of this people. A second one that is also commemorated each year is Israel's return to their land after being 70 years in captivity in Babylon. This is a dramatic moment in the history of Israel. But a third has to be 2 Samuel chapter 5 and 6 and what occurs here of David becoming king, taking Jerusalem, and sanctifying it as the city of God in chapter 6. Each of these promises, though, are promises and fulfillment to not only David, but to Israel and even to Father Abraham, as we'll see. So the main point, the main purpose of this sermon that I want you to leave with and remember for a long, long time, and we need it as tonic for our soul, is number one, the Lord God always keeps his promises to his people. Now, we'll see this as a caveat. It's not always in our time frame, but his promises never have an expiration date. And we're going to see it quickly in three rapid stories. First, God fulfills his promises to David. That's really in the first story, the first few verses. We have just learned last week that Ishbosheth, Saul's son, has died. Thus, it clears the path to David to the throne. And all of the northern kingdoms see this, so they unite, and each of them send one of their elders down to Hebron as delegates to basically, for our sake, vote David in as king. He's got to have 12 votes. They all got to be unanimous, 12 tribes. And it happens finally. So in one sense, David was anointed king three times. First in 1 Samuel 16 by the prophet Samuel, and when he was a little kid, shepherd boy. The second was the citizens of Hebron, the tribe of Judah, made him king. But now all Israel unites at this moment, and they appoint him king over all Israel. Probably like many of us, I mean, it is an election season if you haven't noticed, uh, and all of us, when we cast our vote for a politician, we have reasons why we vote for them, or probably for a great percentage of people, reasons why we will not vote for the other person, right? Uh, the elders of Israel provide three reasons here of why David should be their king. The first is one of relationship, verse 1. You are our bone and our flesh, or more particularly, we are your bone and your flesh. This is extraordinary now to say to David. Remember, he spent 18 months in Philistia, and they are saying he is not a resident alien. He's not a foreigner. He's not a turncoat. He's one of ours. He's our kith and kin, born and reared here in our soil. We are family. So, Relationship is a reason they appoint David as king. A second reason, verse 2, is leadership qualities. While Saul was king over us, you were the one leading us out and in from battle. They finally, all of them, recognized what everyone knew. David was the competent one that held Israel together during the days of Saul. David had slain his tens of thousands. 
And they recognize there is no greater leader in Israel that can lead them but David. And then there's a third reason, and it seems to be the central one, and that is promise. Verse 2, Yahweh said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be leader over Israel. This is a, a beautiful thing. Often, uh, in the way God works, he uses one spokesman to deliver a message to the people, kind of like what I'm doing today, okay? You're the people of God, he is God, this is his word, and I'm just the mouthpiece delivering a message from God to the people of God. But here, it's reversed. The entire people of God now become God's mouthpiece to David. And they say to him in unison, you are God's man. God anointed you. He promised this kingdom to you. And we're giving it to you. This is a beautiful thing from us as Calvary, how we've journeyed from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel, how it all started years prior in 1 Samuel 16, and finally here it is. Do you see it there in verse 2? Do you see how Yahweh's promise to David of so long ago has now come to pass? Do you see how God's promises to him has weathered the venom of Saul the follies of David, the rebellion of the northern tribes, and the self-seeking of his friends? Do you see how Yahweh's promise has proven firm in the face of intense opposition? Chapter after chapter since 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you go back to chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, every chapter since chapter 18 of 1 Samuel up till now has been one person or one thing that has tried to obstruct David from becoming king. And yet, he is king. Why? Because God said he would be. I don't know if the sun was out that day or if there was a light rain in Hebron. I don't know if David, uh, you know, cried like a baby, let out a sigh of relief or high-fived his friends. The day had finally come. What I do know is God's promise to him had fulfilled. And David, the little shepherd boy from Bethlehem, was now the second king over all Israel. God said it, and it happened. So, God's promise to David was fulfilled. Second, in this story, God's promises to Israel as a nation are fulfilled. Now, this is our last story, verses 17 through 25, which if we want to go chronologically, would happen next. So, David is now installed as king. What does he do? He does what King Saul should have done, what God told the king to do, and that's wipe out all the enemies in Israel. And that's David's first priority. But he doesn't even have to start because the Philistines were told in verse 17, hear that David has been elected as king over all Israel, and the last thing they want is a united Israel. And so they actually start marching on Israel. They show up in the valley of Raphaim, armed to do battle, armed to take this, what they think is a turncoat out. I mean, he was their vassal. He spent a year and a half in their land serving their king, and now he thinks he's going to be king over all Israel. So they're going to destroy it before it gets started. So this happens immediately after David is installed as king. And what follows in verses 17 through 24 is sort of a... a, peculiar uh, set of events. David, as he always did before he goes out to battle, he stops and he asks Yahweh what he wants to do. He asks for guidance. That is suggestive. David fights, if you read this section, not one but two separate battles that are decisive and complete. Both times Yahweh gives David different instructions. It's rather curious but there is the same outcome, a total, absolute smashing of the Philistine nation. In both sections, 
the historian describes Yahweh as the one going out with David fighting these battles. In fact, what the historian does for us in verse 20, he uses the same Hebrew root four times to draw this image of what Yahweh is like. We read there in verse 20, So David came out to Baal-perazim, that means, by the way, Lord of the burstings out. And David struck them down there and said, Yahweh has broken through my enemies and before me like an outbursting of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Lord of the burstings out. That's the image David wants to get of what Yahweh did for Israel at this battle. He was like a great hurricane, a tsunami out in the ocean that builds and builds its waves and is this giant tsunami and when it hits land, it destroys everything in its wake. That's what Yahweh did at this battle. He completely wiped the Philistine nation out. The second battle, Yahweh is described as a great warrior and leveler who David has to listen for the tops of the, uh, the uh, mulberry trees, the balsam trees, and God comes in and crushes the Philistine army. Now, I know we just plow through this story, but if you look at history, this is equivalent to what God did against Egypt at the Red Sea. When God got through Egypt at the Red Sea, they were no more a problem for Israel ever again. And they no more were a major rival in the world power. After these two battles, where God comes in like a great wave and like a great leveler, the Philistine nation will trouble Israel no more. And they will not be a power in that state of the world ever again after these two battles. Yahweh, armed with David as the king, with Israel, absolutely crush Philistia in such devastating ways they will never recover. And all because what was David? Do you remember when Israel, way back in 1 Samuel, clamored for a king? Why did they want a king? They gave us two reasons. One was to be like the other pagan nations. But later, in 1 Samuel 8, they said, We want a king who will go out and fight our battles. The very first job description of King Saul was to go out and smash the Philistines, their rivals. And he didn't do it. And he never did it. David's very first action is to do what Saul did not do. And thus, if you'll recall, back in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel was a prophecy that God gave to Israel about David. You remember what it was? Let me read it. 2 Samuel 3, 18. By the hand of David my servant, I will save my people Israel from the hand of of the Philistines. God promised it to Israel and it was true. It was fulfilled. So there's our second people. God promised to David and it was fulfilled. God promised to Israel it was fulfilled. And last, another story that's in here is God's promise to Abraham and it is fulfilled with David. Now that takes us back a ways all the way back, actually, to Genesis 15, where we find the same people mentioned in this story as mentioned here. We're introduced for the first time in Samuel to the Jebusites. They are the owners of this little land that later becomes called Jerusalem. It wasn't back then. The city of Zion, it's often called, or the fortress of Zion, uh, but it wasn't called Jerusalem till later, but the Jebusites own it. They own the city. It's the small portion of land. And David marches. He is purging the land of the Philistines and all, but there remains this little band of pagans. 
that had the city of the great king. He marches around it, and when he gets there, he is met with mockery. Verse 6, you will never come in here, but the blind and the lame will turn you. This is repeated. Now, this is actually an arrogant put down. What the Jebusites are telling David is that sightless eyes and helpless legs are enough to repel this attack of yours. Jerusalem was impregnable. The Jebusites had it for centuries. No one could conquer it, and Israel tried. If you go back to Judges chapter 1, the tribe of Judah utterly destroyed the Jebusites, but they could not conquer Jerusalem. The Jebusites kept control of it. Later on, the tribe of Benjamin tried the same thing. They smashed the Jebusites on the field of battle, but they could not take Jerusalem. It was a stronghold defense. But David knows its weakness. It has an underground water canal from a natural spring so that Jerusalem, if they wanted to, were besieged, and they were later, they could survive on water from this underground spring that would pump water into the city. Well, David knows about this, and he either sends soldiers in, sort of in a special ops mission, single file, to get into the city and open the city gates so the armies could come through, or he just got down in there and cut off their supply. We don't know. All we know is he used their water supply as their weakness, and David, for the first time in over seven centuries, conquers the city and takes it for the first time in the hands of Israel as it was meant to be done. Now you say, why is all this important? Way back in Genesis 15, Yahweh promised Abraham that his descendants would have this land. And he mentions all the people in the land that occupy it. And last on the list were the Jebusites. In fact, several times throughout the Old Testament, this list reappears of pagans in the land that need to be eradicated, and Jebusites are always last, and here they are last on David's checklist to restore Israel to this land that Yahweh promised Abraham centuries ago. And this just tells us, beloved, that God's promises are not our timing. Sometimes we think, well, God promised me this, so by lunchtime I'll get it all. And sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes it doesn't happen in our lifetime. But we learn here that God's promises have no expiration date. They are fulfilled. God said it, and it would happen. Now, the rest of the sermon are questions for us to ponder, two more attributes of God's promises that I would like us to see. First is that God's promises for you, if they are written down in His Word, they are meant to be fulfilled. And we need to remember that God's promises are for your benefit. Verses 11 and 12 happen much later. Uh, I think the historian does this to tell you the nature of the story. Uh, King Hiram hap comes uh, the last decade of David's life, and he builds this beautiful palace of David. In fact, this is the time where this palace is so gorgeous, becomes the envy of the world. David begins to think about building the temple. Remember, he wants to build a temple. God won't let him. It says, let your, your son, a man of peace, coming, let him build it. David actually gets all the blueprints. Solomon goes on David's blueprints to build this temple, and he contracts this Hiram to do it. David dies before this. But Hiram comes and sends all of these materials to build David's palace, and it's the end of his life, and it's glorious. And we're told at that moment, in verse 11 and 12, that David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingship for the sake of his people Israel. David's kingship was not for his own self-aggrandizement, 
as it was for Israel's welfare. David was not merely to be king so he could be king, but he could be king in order to benefit Israel, as all good leaders are. It's not that they're there, it's they're there to serve others so that people see their gifts and are benefited. And I would say today this is exactly what it is with the promises of God. If we're not careful, you and I can study the Bible with a very clinical, detached, sort of uh, academic theologian standpoint. This is orthodox, this is good, and off we go. But this reminds us that the promises of God in the Bible are for your benefit. Thomas Watson uh, would tell us that every time you and I go to read the Bible, we should pretend that we're having a conversation with the real God that sits on the room across for, from us. And he pulls up a lazy boy. And this is good. Uh, Spurgeon would actually go a step farther and say, with each promise, put your name at the beginning of it to personalize it. So, Mel, this promise is for you. And Bev, this promise is for you. And Eric, this promise is for you. That's the way we're to read. Sometimes when we approach the promises of God, we think they're for them. But as David's reign reminds us, he's for Israel. God gave David for the benefit of Israel so they would see that God pro fulfills his promises. I read a story of a young couple who uh, the wife got pregnant. It was to be their first child. And she went to the doctor, got a clean bill of health. And the doctor said, well, now, do you want to know the sex of your child? And she said, well, I do, but can you mail it to me? Because I want my husband and I to share this moment together. He said, sure, no problem. You can expect it in a few days. So a letter from the doctor's office arrived four days later in the mail. The husband scheduled a night out, a romantic date at their favorite fine dining restaurant. It was the desire to sit there at that restaurant under a candlelight dinner, to have a wonderful meal over fine champagne, and at the end of their dessert, for them to open the letter together. And that's exactly what happened. He made the arrangements. They all got doled up. They went to this fine dining establishment. They ate great food. They drank great wine. Uh, the dessert came, and they opened the letter, and it was a doctor's bill. You can imagine how disappointed they were. What a killjoy. That is not the way God's promises are. We're not instructed to run to the scriptures and bank and stand and sleep in the promises because they're a big disappointment. Actually, quite the reverse. If anything we need in this world right now for us getting through it, it's the promises of God that stand for us, for our benefit. And lastly, God's promises are gracious and unearned. This is the last story that is etched in this chapter in a very peculiar way. Verses, uh, the, the, the verses here that give us the commentary of David's growth and his family. On one end, uh, during his life, he had an abundance of children, which is seen as a blessing of God, but they came at the hand of many wives and many concubines, which is a direct violation of the Word of God. So David is quite the tension for us. And as many of you know, those wives and those concubines were his downfall. It reminds me of the story I heard of Martin Luther who described one preacher by the name of Justice Jonas. Luther was impressed by his preaching. He said he's an incredible preacher. However, he has one flaw. Not too many of his listeners will forgive the good man for hawking and spitting on them so often. So for Luther, you had all these redeeming qualities of this great preacher, except for this one, which people couldn't get away from, and he hawked and spit on them a lot. We have to say, as the scriptures say, that David is a man after God's own heart. Yet, what in the world does this man after God's own heart 
have anything to do with multiple wives and concubines, which is a violation of Deuteronomy 17. The text we just read said that God's hand was on this man all of his life, yet every day he's living in violation of that God. So we sit here and say, how can this be? To which I reply, how can we be at the same time righteous and sinful? How can you and I be justified, forgiven, and cleansed, this Bible given to us, and yet every single one of us in this room have violated this Bible this past week in some way? There's only one word, grace. And this tells us that God's promises, like David and like us, cannot be earned. They cannot be merited. They can't be said tit for tat, God, because I did all this, you owe me my wage of a promise. When we go to the Word of God and we read His promises, they are gracious, merciful promises to us. And that is why if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, we live in and through grace. And this word is for you. You a sinner. You someone who has violated God's word by sheer virtue of you existing in rebellion. Nevertheless, God sent his only son Jesus for you on a gracious mission to die, to conquer death, and to give you life if you simply receive it by faith. And we should trust these promises. Uh, this is in one reason, you know, Charles Spurgeon, I hang out with this guy. You probably know that and get tired of that. But he was a, bit, a big advocate and he went through lifelong depression. So there's another tension. There was rarely a week that he was not depressed. And he used to pin Bible verses all throughout his bedroom because oftentimes he was sick and in bed and still was a workaholic. It is uncanny the work he did while sick. And he used to have all of these verses pinned throughout his bedroom so when he was even laying on his back he could read scripture and all of them were promises of God. And he tells his church uh, people, as I would tell you, if you're discouraged you should take the drug called the promises of God. If you're anxious you should sleep on the pillow called the promises of God. If you're prone to pessimism, you should flip back using the promises of God. If you feel like you're wasting away, you should stand on the promises of God. They never fail. They never fail. And they are for you. Uh, two young teenage girls on a Friday night were getting ready to go for a party. To get into this party, they each needed 20 bucks. And one girl whipped out her Andrew Jackson, said, I'm ready to go. And the other girl said, I've got my $20 and whipped out a $10. And the girl said, what do you mean? You got your $20. I only see 10 there. She said, yeah, but my dad's getting off work and he promised me the other 10, so I've got 20. This is a young girl that banked on the promises of God and it was good as gold. And this is what we must live in, in a world that is black with sin and hate and could bring us down with negativity. It is the promises of an unfailing God that set our feet upon the rock. Now, I have no way of knowing for sure, but many people believe that Psalm 93 came out of 2 Samuel 5. That is to say that David took up his pen when he was coronated as king and wrote Psalm 93. If so... Here is the last verse of that chapter. O oh God, I praise you because your statutes stand firm. O oh God, I praise you because your word stands firm. This is coming from a man that had to wait decades to become king after God promised him. And when it happened, he takes up his pen and never forget, beloved, God's word stands firm. We are reminded that as a church. God gives us promises not only in his word, but in his displayed word. We're about ready 
pretty soon in a few minutes to take up one of those promises. Every Sunday, we're inundated with promises. We take the Lord's Supper, we see it in the waters of baptism, we go through our gospel-centered worship service, and it's marinated in God's Word for us. Let us always live, live particularly in these days, during the resounding encouragement of that hymn, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt assail. By the living word of God, we will prevail standing on the promises of God. Father, I thank you for this assembly. Help each of us, no matter where we're at, every single one of us, I pray, walks out of here with their head held high, their spine steeled, their nerves solid, knowing not it's because of sheer willpower that we gut our way through this life. It's because our feet of faith are firmly planted on the rock, and you give us promise after promise that you fulfill. We can take your word to the bank. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name.